Jacobs. I am um, owner with Donna Garbin of Little City Books in Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, we're really glad you could join us tonight for uh, this talk with Tony and Deborah. When I saw that Tony had written a book about a single ballet, I was so amazed and thrilled. And that the fact that it was Serenade is just, um, just wonderful because it's such a gorgeous ballet. And the idea that someone would write about being inside it and um, how what it feels like to dance it. And anyway, it's gorgeous. The book is not only very beautiful to look at, but really beautiful to read. And um, um, the design department did a really good job. There's this gorgeous cover and when you open it, there's this lovely gilded ballerina on the cover inside. And also we have uh, book plates from Tony. So the copies that we have in the bookstore at Little City Books are signed. So when you buy your book from us, I'll put a link in the chat to buy the book. We will send it to you or you can pick it up at the store, a signed copy. Um, we're also, besides Tony, it's wonderful tonight to have Deborah Garrison with us. Deborah was the editor on this book at Pantheon Press. Um, she is also a poetry editor at Alfred A. Knopf Publishers. For years, she was the nonfiction editor at the New Yorker Magazine, and she's also a poet. Um, in fact, I, without permission, put one of your poems in our newsletter last week, and it was very, uh, very much beloved by our readers. People just loved your telephone poem that I just copped. Sorry but it's really great. So anyway, Deborah is going to tell you a little bit about Tony and interview her about the book. And um, I will, let's see, Deborah, are you unmuted? Let's see. Oh, there you are, great. Oh yes, can, can everyone hear me? I'll, I'll jump in, is to, and there's Tony okay, from the hi. West Coast. Hi. Hello, Tony. Hi there, Jeff. Hi, so Kate. much fun to see you and, and thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you to, the Little City Books for hosting us. And I will say, if you don't have the book yet, please do buy it from them because they actually have beautiful, the beautiful um, signature book plates. And I really just so appreciate when um, our wonderful independent booksellers jump in to do an event for a wonderful author like Tony Bentley. So um, really appreciate that. And um, just to introduce Tony a little bit, she, as we'll hear, she danced with George Balanchine and the New York City Ballet for some ye years when she was young, and she is the author of several books about ballet, including the absolutely wonderful classic, probably first ever really ballet memoir, Winter Season, A Dancer's Journal, which I read, I want to say, is it 40 years ago? Yeah. It's it's, I think this is the 40th anniversary year of winter season, which is an, a, another absolutely wonderful book. Um, she also co-wrote Suzanne Farrell's autobiography with her, Holding On to the Air, and other books. Um, her work appears in many periodicals, magazines, etc. She's really a, a unique presence in being a New York City ballet dancer who has such a powerful voice as a writer, and I'm just thrilled to work with her and introduce her. So, Tony, let's begin. And let's start with, well, I'll say as an editor, just receiving some early pages of this book from your wonderful agent, I felt a sense of kind of destiny. Like I started reading it and felt this is a book about a young woman's destiny, about a ballet that is about the destiny of, of women. And I just was so gripped by it. And I knew instantly I will work on this book and I will work with Tony Bentley and she will become part of my life. I just, it felt urgent to me. And that doesn't happen with every book that comes my way. So I was very, very lucky to end up being able to realize that that wish of mine. And But I wanted to ask you to share with everyone how this book came to be. I mean, Serenade, obviously a major important work of George Balanchine that you danced, but you, and, and you decided to write about it, but I understand from you and, and, what I learned when I first acquired the book was that you had started out, set, you had set out to write a more academic book and you were going to do kind of a study or tell us about what the book was and how you came to write this book, which is very much not an academic study, although it does tell us the whole story of the ballet. How, how did it all happen? Um, thank you, Deb. And I just want to back up for a second. Thank you, Little City Books, for having us. Um, 
a female owned independent bookstore that's right up my street. So thank you both very much for that. Um, and Deb, um, uh, Deb is an amazing editor and, and it is like truly, truly a blessing that we came together and that she was interested in editing my book. Um, it's one of the best things that's happened to me in my life. Um, I'll leave it there or I will get start getting uh, sentimental. Um, so to the question, um, yes, this book started 15 years ago in 2007. Um, I originally, uh, I was asked to write about Balanchine and I knew that was too big of a subject for my particular talents and stamina. Um, but I got this idea to write um, like a biography of Sarah Nod. Um, and uh, that book was signed up at Yale University Press, which of course is a, is a very good but academic press. And my original idea was to write like the biography of this ballet, which is, is, is a good idea. Um, but I stalled on it. I did a certain amount of work and research um, and I just stalled on it. And as any writer knows, it's sort of like your, your unconscious or something um, is saying like, this isn't exactly the book I want to write. I'm not really an academic writer. Um, and uh, although I love research and I love facts and I love footnotes, um, interesting footnotes, but um, uh, the stalling on it just went on for years and years. I didn't work on it solidly that time. I did many, many other projects. And then I finally decided I either have to do, get back and do this book or get it really off my desk because it was um, hanging over me. I had an enormous sense of inadequacy about it because it's sort of the equivalent of trying to write about Hamlet or King Lear, you know, and, and, and who, uh, who is adequate to that job. Um, but also I'm, I'm very much like with Winter Season, my first book, I'm very much a memoirist and a very personal writer. And I, um, I think I wanted that in there and it took many years for me to get kind of the courage and the confidence to write the book I wanted to write, which wasn't in any particular genre. It was not an academic book. It was not a purely a memoir. It was kind of a melange of these things. And um, I, uh, you know, because it didn't fit into any genre that kind of scared me. Anyway, uh, long story um, short, uh, Deb very much embraced this kind of more eclectic combination that I did. Uh, the structure of the book is the ballet itself. I take you through, you know, giving you actual minutes and, and very much inside the ballet. But then I go off on all these different tangents, um, both personal and historic. And I did only the ones that I loved. The end result is uh, it's difficult to talk about this um, without it, you know, sound, to have it sound right. But I just wanted to write a book that was the, the, the thrust behind it was what I loved. I loved George Balanchine, I loved Serenade, I loved the music, I loved dancing this, it's, and, and everything I wrote about in it is something that I love. So I would love to ask you to read a little bit from sort sure. of the beginning of your journey with the ballet. So you came up through the school, well, you talk about charmingly about how kind of maybe seemingly unpromising you were as a younger dancer, but you but you got you became passionate. I think you you tell the story of when you were told that your feet were somehow you didn't have the right arch, your feet weren't right, and the teacher called and spoke to your to your mother about it, and you were so devastated about your feet, and suddenly you were tell a little bit how you how you decided you must yeah. dance when yeah. you were told yeah. you were not good enough, possibly. Yes, well, it's not a, a very romantic story about a little girl who saw ballet and said, I'm going to be a great ballerina, and then, you know, 10 or 15 years later is. Um, I went to ballet school like so many little girls do, um, and I liked it, but I mostly kind of liked, you know, the fashion, you know, the, what I could wear. I had like, you know, I started in England, I had red, red shoes and a red belt and a white tunic, and I liked all the accoutrement. Um, and I sort of did once a week, but I didn't, I didn't voice any desire to be professional. I didn't know you could be professional. I thought cl ballet classes were for little girls like me. Um, but what you're referring to is that once I came to the School of American Ballet, within six months of them taking me, and very enthusiastically, you know, I had, you know, the kind of the right body, I was flexible, I was petite, et cetera, had a good jump. 
um, they, I hadn't been on point when I went to the school, I was only 10. And uh, Diana Adams, the great ballerina, um, Balanchine ballerina, uh, was running the school and she called my mother and said, we're worried about her feet. And, and that, strangely enough, it devastated me. I had something far beyond a tantrum. I had a, like a, a, a breakdown and I tossed my toe shoes, went running down my, the apartment building I lived in with my parents in New York and I threw my first pair of toe shoes down the incinerator. And mm -hmm. I went kind of mad. And from that moment forward, I, uh, I had the fire lit under me and, you know, within X number of years, I went from kind of the bottom of my class to, you know, the top of my class with three or four others who eventually was chosen to be in the company. So it was kind of a sort of a defiance a, 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 and, and it was the idea of failing and or the humiliation of it. Uh, was a driving force. As I say, it's not romantic, but it's very, it, that's truly what happened to me. Um, wow. Well, you, so you did, so you continued and you, as you say, you reached the top of your class and you were chosen to be in, I think the first production you speak about when you learned the choreography was like a workshop production, which was an honor to be in that production at the School of American Ballet. Would you read the passage where you first learn, where you first uh, work with Suki Shore and, you, and, you're, and you're learning at yeah. just the very beginning? Yes, I would love to. Suki Shore um, was at the time a new teacher at the school. She'd also been a great ballerina for New York for uh, Balanchine. And I think this was her first workshop in 1974. And I had I had not only not ever learned a Balanchine ballet, I had never seen one. Okay. It was mid-January 1974, and it was the first rehearsal for Serenade. We were all gathered in one of the big bright studios at the school, which was at the time located in the imposing white Juilliard building at Lincoln Center. Leaning on the bars, stretching, we all waited as dancers do for direction. Suki, petite, pert, pretty, and quick in her navy leotard and navy chiffon skirt, started leading girls to places around the studio and told them to just wait there. She started with the tallest ones, putting them in various spots towards the back of the studio. Thus, an empty, open place and a dancer's canvas becomes defined, carved by bodies in space. From blankness and nothing, complexity is soon created. I was not very tall, so I waited with the other small girls with considerable trepidation, still uncalled, unplaced, where would we go? Maybe we would only be understudies. One by one, Suki took each girl and put her in what seemed like an arbitrary spot. Then she took the next girl and placed her at some distance to that one's side. Then another one like that and another. The formation was not apparent. Then Suki started adding girls in front of those girls, not as expected directly in front of them, but rather centered in the space between the two girls behind her. It looked quite strange, but Suki seemed to know what she was doing and we were all in patient obedience. She kept adding girl after girl in row after row, working her way forward while we smaller girls watched and worried and stretched. Stretching for a dancer is her great pastime her way of waiting, staying warm and useful, improving her dancing while not dancing. Finally, Suki placed me and one other short girl in what amounted to a very small front row of only two, again, with each of us quite far apart in spaces formed by the girls behind us. Being young dancers in serious training, none of us had budged from our assigned spots during this process which took quite a while. After placing us last two, Suki backed up to the front of the studio with her back to the mirror and surveyed the scene. She then walked from side to side, squinting her eyes to home in on the lines. There were many horizontal, vertical and diagonal lines in the formation she had made with our bodies. As she moved back and forth in front of us, she nudged a couple of girls a little to the left or right, so they were perfectly centered between the girls behind them 
or two rows in front of them. Okay, she said finally, good. Dancers love to hear this word. They are, after all, on a moral course. Now everyone stand with your feet tight together, parallel. We did as we were told, but never, never before in all our many years of training, most of us, like me, had already been dancing for over a decade, had a teacher asked us to stand in parallel. Ballet is turned out, always. Turn out the rotation of both legs from the hip sockets in opposite outward directions simultaneously was everything, the core of ballet itself. It was what we practiced in class all day and then in our beds all night. I often went to sleep with my feet together and both knees bent and pointed to the sides like a little frog to be even more turned out in the morning. But now we were told parallel. No one knows the meaning of the natural human stance of parallel, quite like a ballet dancer who lives her whole life in opposition to it. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. I love that that you say the dancers are on a moral course. That that was something that just has stayed with me throughout this journey with this book. So you're how many? It's is it 17 that yeah. it opens with? And it's yeah. kind of in the end, it becomes kind of a double diamond. Exactly. Pattern. Yeah. Is that right? That's right. So this you, you speak about the drama of this strangeness of beginning in parallel with the feet straight rather than turned out. Yes. And then the incredibly dramatic moment when the ballet begins in the first few, you can, I think you say in the book, the exact timestamp when the feet suddenly open and the, and all the dancers open into turnout yes. and how, how dramatic and important that is. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Balanchine using his, his use of first position, but without assuming it first, he sort of shows the opening into first position in a way that to you as a young dancer was kind of shocking. And to, to those of us who see the ballet is kind of this assertion of something. And he's, he's new in America, he's, he's young. This becomes such an important ballet, but can you talk a little bit about the, the meaning, that dramatic kind of meaning of turnout for him in, in this moment of choreographing yeah. this piece? Yes, well, it, this was choreographed in 1934. He was just a few months off the boat in um, for coming from Europe, having escaped the Bolsheviks in uh, Russia. And um, uh, he wanted, he used, he famously said that he used this ballet to teach his dancers how to dance. And of course, in 1934, he had a pretty motley group of very eager and keen and bright dancers, but they weren't all trained by him from birth. And some of them were wearing bathing suits and some of them like didn't have point shoes, you know. It There's was, a great picture of that in the book. Yeah, there is. Um, and he, it, was, it wasn't like the trained sort of thoroughbreds that we were at the end of his life. Um, to this day, and uh, Serenade is now, um, so, you know, what, uh, what is it, 70, 80 years old. Um, uh, when the dancers flip their feet open like that, there is an audible sigh by the audience, um, as there is when the curtain goes up. Um, to me, it's kind of an, an incredible announcement, if you will, of saying this is ballet, because all of the human race, we are, we are anatomically born uh, parallel, you know, give or take a little bit. We're supposed to be parallel. That's how our hip sockets are and when we flip open into the 180 degrees that is a declaration that we are in the land of ballet and ballerinas and turnout turnout um, as i just read there is really kind of uh the core and one of the most recognizable things that's very unique to this particular kind of dance all other kinds of dance while they'll swing in and out maybe Every, their movements aren't so based on this turnout, which results, by the way, from, um, from the hip sockets, not the feet. The feet is sort of what people see, but it's the entire leg that has to flip out, which is why we have to start training so young. So um, 
uh, it's very, very beautiful. And of course, once you start doing that as a little girl, you start your first position, you maybe like this, and then it gets a little more and more open. And eventually, you know, by the time I was there, we were 180 degrees as our first position. Um, it's an entirely new world there, you know? And of course we're very, we're standing up straight and we're not leaning forwards or backwards. Our bodies are aligned, our legs are straight. This is not a natural position, but it becomes natural to us through this endless training, you know, like, a, like an Olympic uh, gymnast trains for years. Um, and it becomes a new way of like live, being in the world. It's like a new dimension um, that we learn to navigate. And then of course, once we go on point with it, it's yet another dimension, um, uh, you know, up on our top of our toes. Yeah. So, so you're, you're this group of young women, you were 16 at that time. Yes. And you went on to dance it also, uh, you know, other times once you were actually in the company proper. Mm -hmm. But um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about who those young women were and who, who you're, you're in a ballet, which the, the one thing I found very amusing and touching in the book was Balanchine's kind of assertion that if someone would ask him, well, what does it mean? And what is the story of Serenade? He would sort of refuse meaning and say, well, I'm just moving these pieces around the way I see it. And he, he sort of treated himself it, it, at least the way he presented it, I guess, to you all was that he was kind of a craftsman moving these pieces around in a way that, that looked right to him. But he didn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't admit to a particular meaning of the story of these young women we see on the stage and who come in and out in different patterns and, and they're a group. And then there are moments where there are individuals who come forward. There's some partnering with men that's very dramatic and the men come and they go. And I wonder about you as young women entering that story you know, in your book, you, I mean, in a way, after he refuses meaning, you've spent a whole book telling us what this beautiful ballet means to you. So I wanted to ask you as young women, you know, sort of who were you? I mean, I, I'm amused, Tony, when I think about my, you know, you were in the early 80s do, doing this work. And I was, it, you know, in high school, d d flirting with boys and, and you know, going to proms and parking in cars and the things that teenage girls do. You're, you're a young woman who, in a sense, you don't, you don't really go to high school in the way that other, I mean, your, your youth as a young woman is such a different American story than, than mm -hmm. one like my own and most women, even who, by the way, went to ballet class, which we might've done once a week. But I just want to hear a little bit from you. Who were those young women and, and how did they view the world and how did they view this complicated, piece this is the, the the story of this ballet yes yes well as as uh you know we just said i was 16 i uh i had zero interest in anything romantic and anything to do with that and zero experience and that would have been at the age of 16 at that time in that world we we lived like nuns we were devoted uh, to our studying this art form that we were practicing and to being good at it and better at it and better at it and then better still. Um, so the first thing is we simply become very obsessed with our own role in it, which is exactly as it should be, which is we need to know where we need to be on what count. And that is very complicated and a lot to learn. Um, and we have to learn it fast. Uh, once you're in the company, sometimes they would, I mean, in Balanchine's day, it was famous that you'd sometimes get thrown on a matter of a few hours. I mm. mean, you know, in emergency situations with injuries and things, we were very, very fast learners. Um, I wasn't the fastest. There were some people faster, but, you know, it was, uh, uh, so our focus, while we always knew we were part of, we were like a cog in the wheel of this ballet, Serenade or any ballet, but uh, our focus, as it should be, was entirely on where am I at this point and how do I interact with other, you know, with the, when there's a lot with of the other bodies. Up, yeah. And you have to miss it and everything. Um, in terms of the scope of the ballet and the way I see it now and what I write about in the book, um, uh, I didn't see it or I couldn't wouldn't have verbalized it the way I do in the book now. But between the, the Tchaikovsky music, which creates an entire world unto itself. And of course, 
for Balanchine, the music was always the most important thing. Mm. Um, New York City Ballet, famously, we had to follow the tempo of the uh, orchestra conductor, whereas in uh, many other companies, um, the conductor follows the lead ballerina and kind of bows to what she needs, but mm -hmm. we had to follow the music. It was all about service. It was like a layering of service. Balanchine always said he was in service to God and to the composer. We were in service to Balanchine and therefore we were in service to the music, in this case, Tchaikovsky or Stravinsky, whoever we danced to. And we were in service to the company. We were in service to our other dancers. We were in service to a performance. We were in service to the audience. And this was a form of salvation um, to not be, you know, uh, we were not be, you know, self-obsessed, um, but being a part of a greater, something greater than ourselves. And Balanchine gave us such an incredible opportunity to do that in something that was so intensely beautiful. So while as a young dancer, you've got all your training, you're given these beautiful steps to do and all these lunges, and then you've got all these gorgeous costumes, this beautiful blue tool costume, and you feel absolutely gorgeous. And then you have this incredible lighting once you get into performance of this like mysterious kind of dark, you know, coming and going dark blue light. And then Tchaikovsky's kind of sweet and mournful score. And, um, as I say, I wouldn't have verbalized it, but you're you're in a kind of a uh, world world wide romance of sorts, you know, yes. including in Met Serenade, mostly with other women. Right. Um, you know, this is a ballet about women. Wonderful. Um, so you you also in the book, just for for those who haven't read it yet. You tell, of course, the story of the making of the ballet and you go through the choreography, but you do tell your own story of young womanhood and being a very innocent young girl who, as you say, was kind of in service to this greater idea, but then your world opening to more adult things and, and how that all happened in a way through ballet, through, this, through your time in New York City Ballet, which is wonderful that you weave in some personal memoir, which was fascinating to me. You also weave in some historical mm -hmm. pieces that, as you've said at the beginning, were the ones that interested you. So we get an encapsulated bi biography of Tchaikovsky and the story of his writing the music. We get Marius Petipa. I, I never say that right. Petipa, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Who's the great, great uh, maker of some of the great classical canon of ballet. And I wanted to ask you, so those chapters are woven in to the background of, ba of Balanchine making Serenade. When you when you did dig into Tchaikovsky and Petipa, were there at, these are very famous figures? Were there things that surprised you that you discovered in that research? Yes, very much so, and and also it surprised me that um, both of them, Tchaikovsky, who's really the musical father of classical ballet, given that uh, and in conjunction with Petipa. Um, the cornerstones of classical ballet were Petipa and Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty, Swan Lake, um, uh, La Bea Dare, um, that's, that's not Tchaikovsky, but um, they created the great 19th century ballets. So we all grew up with Tchaikovsky being kind of our musical father. Right. Um, right, but it's very easy to not know anything about him. He's just Tchaikovsky. It's like a world of music. Um, so yes, um, I kind of fell in love with Tchaikovsky. Um, I knew something, but I found out more um, uh, which is not, you know, original research it, to my book, but he had, um, notably, he had a very interesting relationship with an incredible patron, um, uh, Nadezhda von Meck, a woman um, who ad adored the piano, initially a very rich woman, she was widowed, and she adored his music, and initially he wrote some pieces for her on commission, um, and they had a 13-year um, uh, epistle a pistolary? How do, how do you, is that right? Is that how you say it? Friendship, where she, um, they wrote many over a thousand letters of great depth and intimacy and interest, uh, which you can read, they're published um, uh, to each other. But she uh, told him from the very beginning, she never wanted to meet him. And he agreed completely, because they both understood that the man will not be the music, he will be basically, you know, he will be a disappointment. Um, 
<laughs> I'll, I'll leave that there about men being disappointments. Um, but but we're all as human beings, uh, probably a disappointment if, if someone's a great artist because we all have feet of clay, et cetera. Um, anyway, um, and the other thing that not everybody always remembers and I knew but didn't have in the forefront of my mind is that um, he uh, committed suicide at the age of 53 right after writing his last masterpiece, the um, symphony number no. six, the Pathétique, he conducted it nine days before his suicide and his suicide remains to this day um, uh, controversial. Uh, the official Russian version is that uh, he died of cholera because there was a cholera epidemic, but there's many studies and scholars um, uh, and research out there, books, et cetera, that make it very clear that basically because of his homosexuality, he was driven to commit suicide to, you know, he was, uh, for example, it sounds like maybe a particular liaison was about to be outed and it would have, you know, the humiliation to his family and we're talking, you know, uh, Russia, right? <laughs> In the, the czar's time. Um, so he did it to protect his family. So that's incredible tragedy um, mm. of music we have lost. Um, and on Petit Pa, I was extremely surprised by a number of things. First of all, he had a very long, full life. He lived to over 90. Um, it's notable that his great masterpieces that we know, of which there's really only four or five that, that we still have in some version. He made, you know, well over a hundred, but we don't have them. They were all made uh, in, very late in his life, um, which puts the lie to when mostly in his seventies and eighties puts the lie to the fact that, you know, when do artists lose their talent? He, uh, you know, he flourished, but he also flourished once Tchaikovsky collaborated with him. So they kind of came together. Um, the other thing that really surprised me about Petit Pa, um, who had several wives and I think nine children, one out of wedlock with different women, et cetera, um, uh, that it's very well documented, but only recently come to light that uh, he, I, I, he seriously abused his first wife who was a beautiful ballerina for 10 years. Um, there's documentation that's been dug up out of the archives in St. Petersburg. Uh, she went to the authorities and reported it and gave lots of witnesses, etc. So this is a very, very shocking because he, like Balanchine, put the ballerina in the forefront of the stage. Um, behind the scenes, uh, he was not a, um, a good man. Um, so that was very surprising, but his ballets are great works of art that are with us always. I do not believe that if a man has done bad things, you necessarily throw out his art. This I know is a discussion people are having a lot today. Um, art is art and people are people. Um, and I, uh, I, I think it's a given that one has to separate them. So. Well, and you talk about Balanchine's sort of edifice, you know, Balanchine's work is resting on that edifice, which he departs from. And Serenade is of course, an example of ballet that is not the 19th century version with the one starring ballerina being lifted up. So yeah. I wanted to, let's talk a little bit more just um, about Balanchine's idea of the ballerina and who you all were and how he, what he was kind of, in a way he was in some sense, cryptically a little bit of a life coach as well I feel in some of the scenes you have there's a wonderful scene where you talk about being in class and him being there and you're doing an adagio and you extend your leg and he stops and and approaches you and accuses you of what he called giselleitis if I'm saying that right so can you tell that story and and what did he mean I think he sort of says oh well you can go across the street to that other place and do if you want to if you want to dance like that go across the street so tell tell um everyone that story and and what what kind of dancing in that sense is he reacting against and trying to coach you toward yes yes well um this was i mean we all had uh, uh, you know many many uh day in day out um interactions with him and um i think it was probably and, and it was a particularly awful one for me and of course, you know, you're very young and you very much want to please him. I mean, he was, this, uh, uh, and he came up to me and said, dear, you know, if you want to dance Giselle, you can go across the plaza 
And what he means by that is go to the Metropolitan Opera where American Ballet Theater, who dances the classics very well, um, to perform things like Giselle. We did not dance Giselle at New York City Ballet. Um, uh, and um, this absolutely devastated me. And I went to his office after um, uh, the class, I knocked on the door, he opens the door, he says, yes, dear. And I, you know, said, and he like invites me in, he points to the chair, have, sit down, he sits down opposite me, totally focused. He's like, yes, what can I do for you? Um, we were like having these little conferences with him. And I said, Mr. B, I really, probably holding back the tears or not, I really don't want to dance Giselle, I want to dance your ballets. And he said, Great, he said, good, that's settled. And then we talked about other things. I mean, he was, he was that simple and straightforward. I think I, I can only guess why he said that to me. He was a master psychologist. I mean, we would say, uh, and it's true, he could see a dancer do a single plie and he knew everything about you and far more than you did. He, um, it, this was one of the many parts of his genius. He understood what you were like. And I think in me, this is only what I can interpret. He saw that I had, which a lot of us had, but I had a very strong sense of being, trying to be perfect, which was not of interest to him. Um, you know, where that comes from, what I, you know, I won't go in, into, but I, and of course, a lot of dancers, you want to be very good, you want to be very good, you want to be perfect. But of course, perfect is a slippery slope. First of all, it does not exist. And also, he was much more interested in doing something past perfect, you know, stretching an arabesque further, stretching your neck further, making a movement bigger. He always wanted bigger, he wanted more, he wanted expansive, he wanted you to be as big as you can be. And to be perfect, uh, one kind of like keeps things in so that something doesn't wiggle out there that's not in your control. And I was uh, too afraid to do that. And he saw it. So he was kind of just piercing, uh, in a sense, I think, the, the, uh, something that was absolutely true for me, um, that I was um, afraid to go as far as he wanted to go. And this is very much um, what he did with ballet. The 19th century ballet, the classic ballets, um, tend to be more kind of square and proper, you know, like in an arabesque. I don't know if you can all see, I don't really want to be demonstrating an arabesque, but they would do an arabesque kind of square and a balancing arabesque is all like open shoulders, open neck, open arms, arms reaching out, you know, um, much more expansive, very much um, in, the, in the mode of where the 20th century was going. You know, we went to the moon and, you know, um, uh, so, um, uh, he and and at the same time he stripped down like you know Serenade which was not written it was Tchaikovsky just like Swan Lake and Sleeping Beauty are but it was not written by Tchaikovsky for the for as a ballet he wrote it and it was not commissioned either he wrote it he said out of love and he called it my favorite child um, he very Tchaikovsky loved this his Serenade and um, so Balanchine, like with many Tchaikovsky pieces, used non-balletic music for, to make a beautiful ballet. But in Serenade, you know, we have no costume, we have, no, we have costumes, but we have no scenery, we have no tiaras, we have no props, we have no mime, all the things that, that denote uh, a sleeping beauty where, you know, we had no characters, we had no roles. He just streamlined it, kind of streamlined it for the 20th and I would say 21st century. You know, right, it still had, looks so fresh and modern, right? I mean, it's yeah. stunning how, now, I, I, I must mention, as we, um, I'll just ask you one, one or two other things and people, if they have questions, I hope they'll, I hope, please put your questions in the chat. But um, I wanna mention the, the photographs in the book, which are, which yeah. show us these, these lines and these arabesques that you, as you say, are so stretched beyond and, this, and the kind of soul of this piece are, it's captured so beautifully. And the photographs are by Steve, marvelous Steve Karras and Paul Kolnick as, Kolnick as well, who photographed this piece and, and many others for, for a long time. And you really kept, um, you know, you, 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 we see in those images so, some of what you're what you're speaking about. Do you have? Um, before, I, I would love to ask you to read a tiny bit more, but before I do that, mm -hmm. tell me um, 
which images, you know, we see we see this this group of dancers in different configurations, and some, as I said, of the partnering in smaller groups, and then the big group with with the very particular serenade gestures. What is for you the sort of iconic image? What, what stays with you when you look again through the book and look at those beautiful photographs, some of which you're in with with some very, very famous ballerinas. Um. Well, I, it would be very hard to pick one. It really would. Um, uh, the opening image is and always will be um, uh, sort of beyond, uh, just beyond iconic. It's just, um, it has a mystery and a wistfulness and a yearning and an otherworldliness and a sheer depth of beauty that uh, cannot be surpassed. Um, uh, and it's with the 17 girls, all with, you know, our hands up to um, the, uh, as Lincoln called, Lincoln Kirstein called it an intolerable lunar light, which is quite mysterious. Um, and, uh, and then other images, um, the elegy with the dark angel is um, uh, where it goes down to just sort of the solo dancers, um, a single man and one woman, two women, and then three women um, is a, has some very iconic images in it, including um, uh, a, a, um, a kind of a replication of a famous Antonio Canova uh, statue of uh, Cupid and Psyche, where the man leans over as Cupid leans over the woman and she reaches up to him and it's incredibly beautiful. And uh, the dark angel who is kind of represents, I'm, I'm sort of, you'll all need to read the book to really get the story, but she sort of represents fate, like an artist's fate, a man's fate. And uh, she has other plans for him. He sort of dances with the, uh, with the woman, the waltz girl, and then moves on. And it's, um, it's a timeless story of which, as we started out saying, he always said, there is no story. It is just a dance in the moonlight. That's what Mr. B said over and over and over again. So I'm not sure what he would think of what I have written. <laughs> well, I'm sure he would be thrilled that this all continues and that the piece has become what it's become and, and will remain. Would you read just a paragraph or two toward the end of this journey? And um, yeah then I will just invite people again to, of course, buy the book from Little City, but also please type into the chat if you have a question for Tony and I'll, and I'll pick it up. But Tony, give us, just give us one more paragraph or so. Yes, I will. Um, this is, um, I think I'll do right just from, from very near the end of the book. Um, in fact, uh, this is where I sort of question about the famous closing image, which I is also very amazing image of, eight girls on the stage of which I was often, which, which I was one. And then um, the waltz girl is lifted very high, standing on the shoulders of two men and another man. And they take her off on a diagonal. She goes into the light, leaning back, like kind of the prow of a ship. And we all mimic her and it's, and the curtain comes down as we're doing that. It's very, very beautiful. So, so this is uh, what I'm gonna read about. So where do we go in Serenade's final diagonal to where the light goes, to where it comes from? And the beauty, our plebeian princess who was thrice lost takes us there. This is after all, where we all first stood, where I stood when I was 16. The cycle completes, continues. We began the ballet shielding ourselves from the light and end by going into that light becoming light, the journey of the dancer, the story of woman, all women, any woman. Mr. B gave us that, a little thing like that, he called it. Freed in our final incarnation from the exigencies of romance as our central drama. The men come, the men go, we remain, we press forward. We dance for dance's sake. We are but artists, first and last. Balanchine released us into the great wide fullness of female anarchy, our highest expression. His revolution was total, 
if lightly disguised inside a disciplined aristocratic art that brings us back to its birth father, Louis XIV. Radical to the core, Balanchine was that fearless in his love for us, for women. You may or may not believe in heaven, I doubt I do, but I went there once. In Serenade, we are dancing for Mr. B at the pearly gates. His angels, ghosts, fairies, sylphs, Psyche reunited with her beloved Cupid. We are American girls learning to dance, recapitulating the origins of the very art we practice. We are not in a metaphorical heaven, but a real one. The only real heaven is the one that is here, now. We dance it here for you while we dance it there with him watching, leaning as he did night after night on his right elbow in the front wing of eternity, of the vast here and now overseeing a dance in the moonlight. And that makes me quite emotional. Me too. I'm crying a little bit, but I'm going to try to hold myself together. Um, we have a couple lovely questions. And um, Matt says, who also says, what a beautiful passage. What do you miss most about dancing? You talk in the book, by the way, I won't spoil, not too many spoilers, but Tony talks about how her, how her dancing ended and why, which is, is worth the read. But what do you miss most about dancing? I miss being inside Balanchine's world, which doesn't exist now. Um, but when we were in the theater, the New York State Theater, uh, we were in an entire world. We breathed the air that he had created for us in a sense. And that feeling of, of purpose and of beauty and a lot of sweat and a lot of work and a lot of tension and a lot of competition with the end result being the curtain going up and you would see serenade, you would see violin concerto, you would see concerto barocco, you would see second movement bise with Suzanne Farrell. Oh my God. You know, and we were there 12 hours a day. We'd get our toe shoes. We'd wear our funny outfits for rehearsal. And then we'd get these gorgeous Karinska costumes and tutus for these ballets. I mean, it, it was a unique world that will, will never, you know, happen again because of this man. And one can never forget Lincoln Kirstein who made it possible. These two men made this world possible to us and to the audience. And you know, the ballets remain. Yeah, and another interesting question, which we didn't touch on, but, but um, you, you talk about it wonderfully in the book. Uh, Kate asks, can you talk about the elements of chance in rehearsal that Balanchine incorporated? Oh, yes, yes. Well, Serenade is well known for that, which, you know, as I said, he, he started this in 34 with some pretty untrained dancers, and there were probably more mishaps in rehearsal and probably on stage even than we had. And we there were always mishaps, you know, somebody would slip on something. Um, and in Serenade, he, he, he famously incorporated several mishaps into the ballet, which is an incredible, I think, window into one of the ways in which, you know, one always wants to know, get inside, how does, you know, I think as I write in the book, how does genius do genius? You know, it's like something so incredible has happened and it's like, how do they do that? Well, obviously we will never really understand that. However, um, in Serenade, for example, um, there are several times that a girl goes down on the floor, which is not very 19th century petit pas ballet, you know. Um, I mean, Giselle goes down when she kills herself, but otherwise we are very upright creatures that don't go down on the ground. And this happened because a girl, you know, came late to rehearsal one time uh, uh, and, and slipped. Oh, no, the one that came late looked for her place and he kept that. Two or three places in the ballet, he kept the mistakes. I think the first time the girl went down, she started crying and he said, no dear, just stay there. 
Mm-hmm. And just so in the moment, his ability was to be so present, you know, he was all about being present, that uh, there they were in a given moment, he's making Serenade in the studio on Madison Avenue in 1934, and a girl slips, and he says, oh, no, dear, stay there. Maybe, maybe he handed her a tissue because she was crying, you know, probably more, more less from being hurt than more from the humiliation as it is for any young dancer to fall. And, um, and he kept it in the ballet and it's now, you know, it's part of like history basically. And mm. then here he has someone else fall. Um, so he incorporated these, um, these mishaps in, uh, into the ballet. It's great. There, there are other wonderful examples of that in the book. Um, another question here says, Val here as a ballerina wannabe, I can't wait to get into this book. What was the transition like from dancer to writer? That's a fun one because it's really about you writing winter season. Your jur- Tell us about your journal and ha- how you became a writer while you were a ballerina of really 21 or so. I mean, yes. how did you do that? Um, well, it wasn't quite normal. I had, well, I had the normal kind of education of a dancer uh, studying and working on that level. I went to a professional children's school and squeezed in a little math and English between ballet classes, but none of us really focused on school. And, you know, it's not like we were going to like a heavy prep school, getting ready to go to Harvard. We, you know, got what education we could. I barely graduated high school, um, but we were so focused on our dancing. That's, you know, the way it is. We were training for a profession from a very early age. Um, But I became, nothing to do with school, very obsessed with reading um, when I was about 14 and became very, very obsessive about it. I still don't know how I got so much reading in between these, once I became professional at 17, how I managed it, but I did, you know, youthful energy. Um, And uh, um, I started, as so many people do, especially women, perhaps, I started writing a journal. I still have my first one. And I remember the first line written in pencil with something like, this is so embarrassing. Because of course, you're like, well, you know, how could I be important enough to write a journal or something? Um, but anyway, it grew and grew and grew. And it just became, this thing came out of me. And, it, and my first book was just part of this endless journal that I was writing that covered a three month period of time. Um, uh, during a certain season um, where I was having a kind of what what some uh, some uh, reviewers called a midlife crisis at the age of 21 for a dancer where I was wondering, you know, I'd already been dancing for, for seriously for 11 years and I was wondering like, where's, is my career going somewhere? Is it not? Should, do I want it to? I had kind of, you know, a real crisis, which happens to a lot of um, dancers and it's very understandable because it's, I'd only known this one thing. I didn't know the outer world. So that book was published while I was still dancing, but I went back to dancing and I wanted to continue dancing, but then I got an injury that stopped me from dancing when I was 25, 26, which is still very young for a dancer. Um, so uh, I, the way I see it now is um, since winter season had been published you know, to a certain amount of um, attention uh, while I was still dancing, I feel like I was like fate was providing for me that I did have something else I could sort of do once my career was taken from me at the age of 26. Um, so I think uh, what whatever my ability to write is, was definitely something, um, you know, given to me. I didn't ever go to a writing course. I didn't ever, I wasn't good in English. In fact, the only grade I used to get, the worst grade I ever got was a C and that was always in English. So, you know, there's uh, there's just no evidence for it. I think my teachers were, were the books I read. That's all I can say. Well, we've all been the beneficiaries and, and this book is such a wonderful culmination of many things that you've done in the past. And I hope everyone will enjoy it even a fraction of the, of the amount that I've enjoyed it. Oh, and there's Kate to, to see us out with I'm going to put the, the shopping link again in the chat, um, showing you this beautiful book again. I really, I'm very, very fond of the way it opens up to being a pink book with a I gold ballerina yeah. on the cover. Yeah. <laughs> our, our copies have beautiful signed book plates in them that Tony sent. And um, so come get it at Little City Books. Thank you, Tony. This was amazing. I've been just kind of crying off and on the whole time. And Deborah, thank you so much for a wonderful interview. 
Thank you for having us. I'm so glad that we were able to do this. And everyone, thank you for coming and joining us tonight. Thank and you so much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Deb. Bye. Good night. Good night.